Hi everyone, uh, thank you very much for coming along to my talk. Uh, this is uh, a talk about narrative design and control with specific attention to the motel sequences in control. And I kind of wanted to share my current thoughts with you on narrative design, looking back on my experience working on this game, which was my first AAA game. And um, I kind of wanted to talk about it um, in terms of artistically, so going through and finding the right artistic tone um, to convey as a narrative designer, but also pragmatically in the organisation of, of people in a team to get that across, which is not so much about production as it is about um, getting clear communication throughout the team about the uh, aesthetic purposes of the story as well. Um, so before I get too far into it, um, I'll talk a little bit about myself, um, just to give you some background. Um, I come from an indie development background. A lot of the games that I've done are um, on small teams and are smaller games than Control, but they have always had their own strong artistic direction. Um, the Gardens Between, exam for example, Paperbark and Florence, they all have a very clear, strong direction. So um, I have worked on many teams where that's been a necessity to get a certain narrative tone and mood across. Um, and I started out as a university lecturer, actually, um, and found my way into games by um, sending some samples of writing to the voxel agents. And then they had me um, for the gardens between and from there I freelanced as a narrative designer and then had the opportunity to work at Remedy. So I moved from Australia to Finland and haven't really looked back. Um, so before I dive in, um, too far into uh, specific the moment to moment of narrative design on the floor in the studio, I wanted to talk a little bit about what narrative design is, because people uh, can have many different ideas of what this discipline is. And in fact, rightly so, because it can differ between different studios. Um, and I talk about narrative design as um, the job for looking after all the elements of the game that allow players to interact with the story. Um, and uh, Eric Sturpey and Molly Maloney have a really great talk on the GDC vault um, where they talk about the relationship between the writer and the narrative designer. And they say that the writer's prime concern is with the character's experience of the story, whereas narrative designers focus on the player's experience of the story. And these two things, um, both writers and narrative designers pay attention to, um, but the focus is slightly different. So a writer might be thinking, what would the character say in this moment and what would they be thinking? And a narrative designer is thinking, um, what does the player need in this moment? to understand the story from, from uh, you know, a play experience perspective. And another favourite quote of mine about narrative design is from Caitlin Tremblay, who also has a talk um, on, uh, I think it's on the GDC vault, about um, narrative designers game design. And she says that what we do in a game suggests a certain kind of emotional story. So whatever game mechanics, whatever way you're asking players to interact immediately suggests a kind of story or a kind of atmosphere, a kind of tone to the game. And that's what narrative designers are concerned about. They're concerned with those specific interactions that have to do with, with getting the story across. Um, so they have to think about the play experience from a holistic perspective because you're dealing with the game as a narrative world um, and many people helping you articulate it. So um, this is about um, understanding creative intent of a game and the people that uh, we're working with as narrative designers. And I hope that ultimately this is about helping design and communicating the play experience of the story and, and bringing people together to help see that through, which I think is part of narrative design, at least it is in the way that I practice it at Remedy at the moment. Um, and I didn't actually imagine that I would be talking a lot about creative intent um, for a narrative design talk, but it seems really relevant, especially for control, because we had so many um, 
we had so many ambitions for the game because it is a new game for Remedy. It's a new IP. It's a new narrative world. Um, it's, it's a new weird narrative world. And we had to really search for what that theme and tone was. So when coming onto a project, as I did, I came in the middle of development for control. So a lot of my challenge was to understand the creative intentions of a project as quickly as I could. Um, and also, you know, understand this from, from the perspective of the game. But even before, um, in pre-production, um, you know, directors and leads are working together to develop the creative intent of, of a game. Not necessarily, you know, it could be any type of game. That's usually how it goes. And then they work to communicate it to their teams and then people can add their own um, intentions and directions within the bounds of that. Um, part of then understanding the creative intent is advocating for those intentions. So getting the intent from, from those who are setting the intent and, and you know, funneling it down and communicating it on their behalf. Um, that's what I'll be talking about today. And then assessing if the current elements in the game fit with the intent because I, I picked up um, the motels, which I'll speak more about um, halfway through development. So, so looking at what's already been built and determining if that's currently working and then designing and iterating with others um, while staying true to those intentions, which I'm going to cover as well. So that's what I mean by creative intent, just to make that clear. And so, one thing that I find I uh, found on looking back on my work on control really helpful as a tool is to think about the narrative mood and you can also use this tool uh, when you're starting out developing your games or developing your story um, and narrative mood is an approach to how to understand the atmosphere of a work or the the general feel of a work um, and um, this can apply to all kinds of media, TV shows, movies, books, things that really hold our attention are things that have a certain vibe or an atmosphere to them that we really enjoy. So, for example, Mad Men has a certain atmosphere. Game of Thrones has, a, has its atmosphere, has its own, um, you know, certain things that are true about the world and how it feels. Um, and narrative mood is made up of the setting of a piece, the language and tone and point of view and word choice that's made for a book, for example, or in the cinematic language in a film, or even in the game language in a game. And then the themes or what the work is about or reoccurring ideas. And ideally when you're creating a narrative, you're considering many of these things up front in your pre-production. But you can also use this tool to reverse engineer as I did what was going on and then you know really sinking into that narrative mood understanding it and then being able to communicate it and if anyone has played control um, then they would know that control has a certain mood to it it's very distinct and I'm going to go into that a little bit more um, but still on narrative mood some examples Disco Elysium has a very specific narrative mood that is quite different to Journey, but they both have a different vibe. <laughs> it's, it's hard to put your finger on, but, but these stories are quite different. One's a detective story and one is more about, um, you know, going on a journey that is both inner and outer in a, in a way that's, for example, tone, there's no language there specifically. The tone is in the music and in the colours and in the soundtrack and um, how we are allowed to interact in that particular world. So that's narrative mood as a, as a tool. And I want to talk about now getting into that for control. So when I jumped in, um, looking at the setting for control, this is game is set in a strange um, shifting building uh, called the oldest house. It is a place of power and it is a place that's um, home to a government bureau, a government organization who are studying um, and trying to contain and understand the unexplained um, and the unsettling and the supernatural. So that's where the, that tone, new weird tone comes in. Um, and then the themes are of shifting reality. 
control and belonging with that's sort of my take on it because Jessie arrives at the oldest house looking for her brother and instead becomes the director of the Federal Bureau of Control and the building is currently under attack by an otherworldly force known as the Hiss. So she has to figure out that role, find her brother and save the Bureau. Now, ways to get into the narrative mood of a piece if you're entering halfway through development or if you're setting out to, um, to set the narrative mood for your game, um, think about the references that you can um, draw on or that the team is already drawing on. In my case, reading through the World Bible, scripts, current design documents, art direction, all of these things really helped me sink into the world of control. So for example, we have some of our inspirations here being Twin Peaks and Annihilation. I was reading current scripts that had been written both um, for the Vita, but also um, in development currently and really kind of sinking into the word choices that were being used and how the dialogue was being constructed and things like that. But then also aesthetically looking at um, beautiful concept work, um, that's being done by the art department. And this slide here is a sneaky sneak peek at uh, Stuart MacDonald, our world director, his talk that he will be giving at this conference too, uh, about setting uh, the, the tone of the world um, through brutalist architecture in the oldest house. It's an incredible talk. And you'll see how very much everyone at Remedy works to set up a, a very distinct world. And narrative mood definitely for the game um, has been contributed to heavily by uh, our artists and our lighting artists, our environment artists and world director as well. So looking at the game as a whole to get into the narrative mood. So um, I want to now, now that we've looked at control as a whole and, and sinking into that and trying to understand what it is, um, at least that's the position I was in. It did take a while. Um, and now um, I want to give a practical example of what this looks like in action. Um, but first, I would like to defer to Dr. Darling um to explain what the ocean view motel and casino is and this is um one of the videos that we have throughout the game of dr darling explaining strange events in the world so i will play that video now during an awe investigation our agents discovered a light switch cord in a butte bungalow closet they pulled the cord and were instantly transported to the Ocean View Motel and Casino. Dream like hell! Inside, they found a door marked with an inverted black pyramid. And just like that, it led back to the oldest house, some 2,000 miles from Montana. Now we're finding the cord and an increasing numbers throughout the Bureau. Somehow the two places, they became in tune to each other. The, the actual physical location of the ocean view is, is, is a mystery. Stepping beyond his walls has so far proven impossible. A place of power, like the oldest house. Okay, so uh, that certainly helps start to set the tone for these motels. So the motel sequences, I came to them because um, as a narrative designer, my job was to look after side missions in control. And there were a few motel sequences in the side missions. And then we realized that there, well, I realized there were some in main missions as well. And it became obvious that it was, that we needed a narrative designer to look after these sequences as a whole package because they were being um, built by, or looked after by different environment artists and level designers, just purely by the way that they had been um, spaced out across the game. Um, so having reviewed the narrative and got into the narrative mood using a shared language and understanding that in the narrative team, uh, I jumped on board to the, the motel and casino. So um, 
The way that it works is it's connected to the oldest house, accessed by a light cord. Jessie pulls on the cord three times. She then solves a puzzle in the motel, so she's transported there. She gets a key to unlock the pyramid door to then access other areas of the oldest house. So originally the motel sequences were a way to um, open uh, the way forward for the player in the oldest house, but then that was changed into uh, the job of control points. So we still had this I cool idea of solving puzzles or these strange dreamlike uh, uh, ritual-like puzzles that really fitted the tone of the game, but we didn't have a place to put them. And then the idea for the motel and casino was it allowed us to move the player um, in the oldest house, like transport them from one place to another or unlock a, um, a fire break so that they could get across by, um, by, I guess, by taking them to the motel and then and bringing them back again, having changed the environment to let them go forward. So it's got a pragmatic, uh, useful, um, I guess, addition to the game as well as being cool and fun. <laughs> so um, uh, I did mention, yes, they appear in main and side missions. So before I get into um, the motels, I wanted to show a complete motel to show you the sequence as it is in the game. And then we'll look at what what I came on board with when it was there and, and how we got to this point. So I'll play that video for you now. <laughs> So this motel sequence happens in mission six. So this is not the first motel sequence. The first one's a lot simpler than this one. In this one, um, you can, well, in all of the motels, Jesse can ring the bell to open the different doors down the hallway. And in this one, the furniture is on the ceiling and the key is actually on that table. So we need to get the furniture up the right way. So the problem is relatively clear to the player by this point that they need to change things in the motel in order to move forward. So Jesse turns a painting up the right way in another room. she finds the pyramid key that she can take to the door marked with the black pyramid. Okay, and the way forward is open. So, um, when I started out, I got into the narrative mood of these of these motel sequences because they are different. They have a different take on weirdness in the oldest house. So they are a transient space. So the way that I did this too is I went and spoke to Sam Lake, I went and spoke to uh, Mikhail Kasuninen, and I went and spoke to um, Stuart McDonald, so our world director, our game director, our creative director, and said, hey, you know, I've been asked to look after the motels. I would like to understand how you view these and what their importance uh, is and what um, what your creative intentions are for these things, for these parts of the game. Um, and what came out time and time again was ritual and dream logic as a theme, um, a new weird tone. It's meant to be unsettling, but it's also the the only other time we actually leave the oldest house in the game is to go to this place, this other place of power. So it's also laying down a mystery for the players as well and creating a space that's it's kind of transient and in transition. And um, we were talking about how um, we would like players to feel like there are people in the motel and they're just around the corner, but you just somehow I'm missing them. You're not quite seeing them. So in some motels, we actually have people knocking on the door outside. You, you can hear voices and people moving around in different motels, but you never see them. 
um, and, and it gives it this empty but you know there are presences there's you sense presences in the, in the um, motel at least that's what we were aiming for so breaking it down this way i sort of understood um from the leads and directors what what their intentions were for this and then i went ahead and looked at what was there um, and what was there currently um, was a lot of um, placeholder design, which is completely fine and normal. Um, there were a lot of ideas in these spaces and really good ones. Um, in particular, um, they were puzzles with many steps. They were really good puzzle ideas. They had all been paired together um, to see, you know, approximately how this space could work, you know, what a dream logic puzzle looks like or what a, um, you know, I guess repetitious sort of um, interesting weird puzzle looks like in this kind of game. Um, however, the, the themes were unclear and, and as you can see in these images and you'll see in a moment, the environments are not, you know, propped properly at all, um, which is also fine and normal for where these were in the game. But let's take a look at what the motels were when I jumped on board and then we'll talk about how I went ahead and um, uh, pull, pull together a new narrative design for them. So this is an older video of the motels. Um, again, we kept the idea that the opening of the doors are tied to the bell. The reason being is because the player, when they ring the bell, they can see down the hallway, so they can immediately see the effects of what they've done. And this particular puzzle um, asks Jesse to open a safe. So you can see we've used um, just text on the screen to indicate there may be some dialogue to help the puzzle along. And then we've got a room that's too dark to see. And so already there are two problems that have been set up. We need to get into a safe and there's a room that, that we can't um, see. And there's probably something useful in that room. So this room has a raven that you can talk to and also some blood on the couch and things like that. All these... Um, these symbols and things are, I guess, in tone in that they're unsettling, but um, I'm going to question as to whether they actually suit the tone and theme of the of what we were hoping for for the motels. So she gets a piece of paper with a number four. Um, there's a raven that that tells kind of a riddle. And you can actually use your weapon in this motel, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about later. I'm not going to play this all the way through, but um, also note that Jessie can use her abilities here. And it's sort of about looking around the room and trying to find what's going on. This particular puzzle too, as you can see, has great ideas, but it's also requiring a lot of dialogue to help the player through and sort of point out what they what they need to be looking for. So I'm just going to skip ahead a little bit here. So Jesse is able to unlock the safe and get a light bulb that will then help with the dark room. And now we have the final part of the puzzle where um, Jesse needs to find the right shape on the projector and the right light. So naturally, the pyramid is the right shape.
and then the key is revealed. Okay, so that's a look at um, a very old rough motel sequence. So when I went ahead about rebooting the motel, so to speak, um, I collaborated with others to pull together a new plan. I didn't by any means come up with this all by myself, but uh, I specifically spoke to the level designers for each of these motels. Some of them, there were different level designers for different motels or some had two or three uh, together. So. After that, I called a meeting to repitch the motel designs and the idea was to set the mood, state a clear direction and give actionable changes with clear intentions for these spaces. Because there are a lot of great ideas here, as you can see, but they're not quite gelling with the theme and with the tone of what we would like from the motel sequences, the creative intent of them. So how do you bring those two things together? Um, well, I pulled together a design which was meant to be the starting point for a discussion. Um, I also invited everyone who was working on motels from sound designers, lighting artists, environment artists, level designers, the writers, um, anyone who had anything to do with these places. Um, it, seems, it seems obvious, but some in the heat of development, um, it can be tricky to bring everyone together at the same time, but it just saves so much trouble once you can have everyone in the space. Um, I think I also left out animators. So we had everyone who had something to do with a motel. And this is the title slide of my presentation that I gave um, to them about these motels. So I'm gonna show you some examples of the slides that I gave, um, of the presentation that I gave. I first of all pitched that we would use interact only in these motel spaces and Jessie would not be able to shoot or use her abilities. And the reason is to keep um, to keep the tone. It, it seems a bit odd if Jessie, I mean, her launch ability is so amazing, but it's very overpowered. And so in that space, using it as a way to pick up objects and move them, it just feels, it feels a little bit too much. Um, and, it, and also pulling out her gun and shooting pictures off the wall we didn't want those things to be part of the solving the puzzles because it, it seemed against the idea of being a transient space, of being a bit strange. Um, and so we, I proposed that we remove them and, and everyone agreed, which was great. Um, and I also proposed that we make these puzzles um, more about setting a tone than actually about really challenging the player. They're not meant to be very difficult puzzles, but they're instead meant to be a series of actions that are uh, kind of have a dream logic to them and have repetition to them. Again, using um, a game design to create the emotional experience rather than be about a hard challenge. So I paired gameplay words with narrative keywords here. So exploration, raising questions, curiosity, rituals, um, and the, a place of power, our Americana sort of motel setting and the creepy weird flavor. Then I worked with our environment artist, Mikey, to, um, I guess, talk about what we would like out of the motel. And we really liked the idea of the motel, each room being exactly the same, um, because that's generally how these kinds of roadside motels are. And that gives it that repetition, that, that sameness, that transient space. Um, and she was really, really cool with that and on board and we found some reference images together and I suggested some props um, that, she, that she could start with and she went from there. Um, and then I worked with Jonas to put together this slide and he went ahead and made this image um, to talk about the logic for the level designers. Um, and then for each of the motels, I made one of these slides that clearly states where it is in the game, the purpose of it, um, what will happen in the puzzle, and then if there are extra art or audio requirements. Some motels require extra audio requirements because um, the one I just showed, for example, has screaming or another one in particular has um, a Finnish weather forecast. 
So they're, they're all slightly different and, and custom in that way. So we had to be very clear about which motel had what. Um, and here's another example. This is the one that we saw towards the start of this presentation where um, the puzzle was turn me up the right way, which is just a name that I called it where you had the furniture on the bottom and you had to uh, at the top and get it to the bottom. And again, just calling out extra audio requirements and things like that. And this was really useful um, for the rest of the team because all kinds of things came up in particular. Um, so, and I'll give you some examples of that in a minute, but for these, we had regular reviews of the motels. Um, I proposed a puzzle design. I gave prop lists, animation lists, audio asset requirements. So all of these things were very much in the wheelhouse of what my responsibility was for this project. Um, and as well as, um, you know, requesting extra lines from Jesse, for example, if we need some her to comment on something in particular in a motel, um, then I would request that of our writer Clay, and he would go ahead and write that appropriately. Um, and so some challenges in all of this, first of all, was getting the tone right for the motel and for the one that I showed you in particular. Um, this started with uh, a discussion around players need to understand that they've completed a puzzle and audio cues are a great way to do that. It's sort of a confirmation, ding, you've, you've solved the puzzle, you, you should be able to pick up the key and move on. But the question was, um, what should that sound like when a player picks up the pyramid key? It doesn't really suit the tone of a motel either to have a puzzle complete noise. Um, and so I worked with um, Sam Hughes, our sound designer, one of our sound designers, and um, we explored what a mysterious black triangle key sounds like. We were talking about the symbology of the black triangle in the game and that it's connected to the board and what they might sound like. And so then he was able to, once I'd given him the creative intent, and once he'd been a part of those meetings, he was able to apply his own creativity to it and come up with a, a cool sounding stinger for when the puzzle is finished. It's the kind of detail that um, players and people playing the game might not pick up on, but we were really, um, really concerned with the detail to make sure that all of this fitted with the narrative mood and, and um, felt like a cohesive experience. So this was one challenge. Um, another challenge was staying on theme. So for this particular motel, um, when we saw the furniture was on the roof, I was reviewing the motels and I perhaps hadn't looked at this one that week. And um, Sam, our sound designer, messaged me and he said, oh, I've noticed that the room shakes now when the furniture moves to the floor, you know, once that happens. He said, I don't, I'm really sorry, but I don't have time, you know, in the heat of development to make custom sounds and new sounds for all kinds of different furniture <laughs> falling from the roof to the, to the floor. He said, I've also noticed that there's dust particles do I need to um, put in a sound for the, like, is the building moving? And then what does that sound like? And I said, I didn't know any of this had happened. So we jumped into the game. We had a look. Indeed, the room was shaking and things were happening. So I went over, uh, we went and spoke to the level designer um, and he said, oh, I thought it would be really great if we had, um, the room shake and some dust and maybe, you know, um, so that the player would know that the furniture had gone from the roof to the ground and that the puzzle was solved. He said it was for player guidance. And it's like completely right decision to make. Like it it's definitely makes it clearer for the player. It definitely conveys what's happening. There's a certain affordance there that's really smart design. Unfortunately, the smart design didn't fit with the narrative mood because then I sort of had to explain. I said, well, the furniture isn't actually falling to the floor. It's mysteriously <laughs> changing. Um, and that was, that was tough because I had to ask him to undo his work and that's more time uh, out of his day, even though, you know, he sort of had he had like it wasn't a wrong decision it just wasn't on tone 
And so he went ahead and reverted those changes. And fortunately, <laughs> we didn't have to make a, a lot more audio assets for that just one sequence. Um, but that's an example of when things can seem right from a gameplay and affordance perspective, but not necessarily fit the narrative tone and something for narrative designers to keep an eye on. Um, and another example too was um, when we had, a, we were talking through this particular puzzle and I said, Jesse will turn a painting up the right way and then that will ensure the furniture has changed. And the animator said, oh, excuse me, um, in no other part of this game does Jesse turn something up the right way. So what does that look like? Does she go like this? You know, does she, and we were sort of acting it out <laughs> with each other to figure out what the movements for the character would be. And she said, well, um, in the heat of development, uh, that is a, that's a custom animation. There's no other part of the game where Jesse turns a painting up the right way. Is it possible that we can find another interaction or something that I've already got? And I said, yes, of course, let's look at it and talk about it. And we ended up with the, she sort of touches the painting and then the painting moves itself, which is completely on theme and, and was a smart way for us to avoid that extra work that, that would have had to have been done. Um, so there's some examples of, of what came up in the motel as we were going through. Um, and there's some examples of, I guess, sticking with creative intent and guiding uh, a, a group of creative people through in order to use the creative tent, intent as a platform for them to then put their expertise into, into the game. And that's what I think part of narrative design is, is looking after all of the games that allow players to interact with the story, which is being able to ex assess the creative intentions and then um, inspire the people working on those parts of the game to add their genius and their artistic ability to it. Because once they understand the narrative mood, once they understand the creative intent, they can work with that and probably come up with things that, uh, and definitely did come up with things that were a lot better than my initial sort of design suggestions. So that was um, an absolute pleasure and privilege. So, um, Narrative mood then and narrative design is not just about the story, but about the emotional experience that, that we're trying to create for the player. And that can mean focusing on others' creativity and creating materials that convey these intentions to them in order for them to, to um, do the rest. And, and that's how we pulled the motel sequences together. Um, and so that's my talk about narrative design. Um, we're going to have some questions now, so please feel free to ask me more questions about this and, and we can get into a discussion about it. Thank you.